Hey folks, today we got 15 new things to know in my full in-depth review of the new Garmin 41 955. Now as usual, this review is based on all sorts of real world usage, swim, bike, run, hike, all the things I've been doing with this watch putting it through its paces so I can tell you about what works really well and what might need still a little bit of work. And then towards the end of the review, we'll dive into all the accuracy charts. But of course, I've also got my full 13,468 word review on the screen that you see right now for even more details. So with that, let's get straight into it with the very first item, which is that there is a solar edition. So there's actually two editions. There is a solar edition that you can see the little solar ring on the outside there, as well as a base edition. The base edition costs $499 and does not have solar versus the solar edition is $599 and does have, well, solar. The two editions of the 41955 are identical, except for, of course, the solar panel and then the battery life impacts, positive impacts, that is, of having that solar panel. You can see the solar panels on the unit itself, but there's actually two of them. There's a solar panel on this outer edge. That's that kind of almost reddish looking area right there, about four millimeters on the inside there. That has a photovoltaic level of 100%, meaning it's effectively capturing 100% of the sun's rays. There's also like technicalities there, but for simplicity's sake, 100%. And then sitting atop the entire screen is another layer that has about a 7% photovoltaic level, meaning only about 7% of the sun's rays hit that. But of course, that's a much bigger space there. You can see the solar level itself at any point in time on either the watch faces or down into the solar widget. And if I look outside now, this little sun that has basically 10 blocks to it, uh, when it's filled up fully, that means there's roughly 50,000 lux sun conditions coming in. 50,000 lux actually isn't that much. Even in the winter on a sunny day here in the Netherlands, I'm cruising about 70,000 and lux and in the summer if i'm at the beach or in the mediterranean or the caribbean wherever it may be you're going to be clearing like 130 to 150,000 lux so way more than the standard 50,000 lux that garmin talks about here the good news though is that while all garmin specs are talking about 50,000 k solar power the reality is anything beyond that is gravy for you you actually gain that in terms of capacity and energy into the watch itself okay and a quick note if you're finding this video interesting or helpful or useful whatever the case may be if you could just whack that like button at the bottom there it really helps out this video in the channel quite a bit. So next up is a biggie, and it's the addition of multi-band GPS to the 955. We saw multi-band, or otherwise called dual-frequency GPS, added in the Phoenix 7 series earlier this year, and that's basically considered like the holy grail of GPS accuracy. And when it first launched on the Phoenix 7, you could clearly see the benefits in more complex areas, in mountains and stuff like that. But as each successive month's gone on, they've been continued to improve the accuracy, and you're really starting to see it come out in a lot of areas. And probably the best example this was a run just this past week I did where I went and did this like zigzag kind of swerve through the downtown building area here in Amsterdam. This is the business district that has buildings that are 20 plus stories tall, but yet very, very tiny streets in between them. And I meandered up and down and you can see the GPS track here. Uh, it's astounding. It is almost perfectly on the road despite being right in the middle of it. Of course, all this comes at a cost and that cost is battery life. If you enable multiband GPS, which is actually the default for the 955, it halves your GPS battery life from roughly 42 hours down to 20 hours. Okay, so next up, a bit of a breather here on something that's a little bit easier, which is touchscreen. See right here, I can just simply swipe up like this, tap into them again, and so on. The good news though is that you don't have to enable touchscreen, and by default, it's actually disabled for most of the sport modes. You will have to individually enable it for the sport modes and features that you want, and you can disable it entirely across the watch if you'd like to as well. For me, over the last while, I mostly just use the buttons. The one scenario the touchscreen does help out is mapping, which allows you to go ahead and kind of move the map around with your finger, but the only caveat being you still have to use the buttons to enable that during the map mode. And then once you enable that in the map mode, then you can go and like move around the map and all that kind of fun stuff. So next up, we've got running power. Garmin has finally added native running power. Kind of, sort of, mostly. So in the past, Garmin had running power on their watches, a lot of their watches, for many, many years, in fact, uh, using a Connect IQ app. That was an app you had to load on there, and then from there you had to have a compatible Garmin accessory, something like the RD Pod, the HRM Try, the HRM Run, or the HRM Pro Straps. That fed data into this Connect IQ app, which gave you running power. That was pretty cumbersome. The good news is that Connect IQ app is now gone. Well, he's gone on this watch anyways, and they've built it into the watch itself. And then with that, they added things like running power zones natively into the watch, just like you'd have for cycling, as well as the ability to go ahead and create running power-based workouts that you can push to your watch. Uh, you can do data fields that are based on running power. Uh, it's all very clean and very native. The problem is that you still need to have one of those Garmin accessories, whereas both Coros and Polar do not require those accessories. They can just do it natively on the wrist itself. So next up on the list is the addition of maps and map 
downloading via Wi-Fi. And some of you are like, didn't we have maps on the 945? And you did, yes, you did. But if you ever traveled, trying to add maps of another region was just a giant cluster of a dumpster fire. Now it's easy though. Now you can do it over Wi-Fi and you can choose other regions and countries easily via the watch itself, download all those maps for free, including all the popularity routing and the heat map data. These are the topo active maps. And the unit itself has 32 gigs of storage space. And then while we're at it on maps, they also added the new ski view maps. Uh, those maps have the resort names and all the trails baked into them too, as well as the cross country map. So next I'm gonna dive into what I think are the biggest changes to the 955 itself. I know it's easy to like get distracted by solar panel and multi-band GPS and all that's cool. But these next pieces here, are far more impactful day to day for most people. And the first one is HRV status. So now it'll automatically go ahead and track your HRV status at night. And you can see this in a widget right there as well as something I'll talk about in a second called the morning report uh, that shows it when you first wake up. So this is my HRV status right there. And uh, you can see it's got this kind of color band. And this HRV color band status is based on my customized ranges. Uh, so both the widths of each one of these sections as well as the numbers themselves vary. And they vary based on your historical data. This won't even show up for the first three weeks of using the watch. 19 nights to be very precise there. Uh, but once it does, each morning you'll see where you stand based on a seven day rolling average. The key thing though is that this is not designed to be like one bad night ruins it, which is a pretty big difference between some of the other competitors out there where one night like just kerplunks everything. Garmin says that one night should not change this notably. One night of drinking, one night of not sleeping, one night of something else uh, isn't going to change this. Instead, it's that seven day trending against your baseline. If I tap down once, I can see my night last night and this shows how variable HRV is and that's based on your sleep phases, even what sleep position you're in, uh, whether or not you drank the night before. There are tons of factors to this and the key is that HRV is all about long-term trending, not short-term trending. I can also then go down again and see my seven day values. You can see they've changed a lot despite the fact that I've kept things relatively stable. But what's most notable is probably the next piece of that, which is training readiness. So if I go back to the widgets there, you'll see this training readiness option. And this is essentially combining a bunch of different pieces together. So right now it says my training readiness as of this second in the day is 67. But if I were to go out for a run, this would actually drastically reduce. Uh, and the reason why is if I look at the factors here, these are all the factors that make up my training readiness. So you see at the top there, I've got my sleep. And you can see last night, my sleep quality was fair. But this sleep here isn't just last night. It's actually the last three nights worth of sleep data fed into that. I look at my recovery time. This is my recovery time since my last workout. Right now, I'm fully recovered from my last workout. But as soon as I go out for my interval workout here in a few minutes, this will jump up again. And this will change the entire picture here. My HRV status is balanced. Again, this is a seven day trending against your up to 90 day historical background. Uh, if I go down again, my acute load, this is the load from the workouts over the last seven days, but it's also weighted differently than the past. In the past, it was a seven day straight load, but now they burn off the older data faster. So if you had a big ride last weekend, it'll have much less effect as you get closer to the next weekend than it would have for just the day after that ride. Going back again, we see sleep history. This is the last seven days of sleep history. And then going down again, we see stress history. This is the last seven days of stress history. So all these components make up what is ultimately this training readiness score. So each morning when you wake up on the watch, you will see, it'll say good morning. It'll basically give you a summary of last night's sleep data, last night's HRV data, your current recovery, as well as your upcoming training readiness. It also shows things like the weather and any structured workouts that are planned as well. And then I can look at all those stats and decide whether or not I should train as planned today, or maybe tweak the plan because things aren't looking so hot. Speaking of the plan, there is a new race calendar and race widget. So if you go and add some events to your Garmin Connect calendar, they will show up here. Uh, I've I've got this race right here on Friday, uh, Mont Ventoux against Mr. Dez. Uh, and then down here, I've got a fake race in July against a friend. I'm still going there, just I'm not sure if he knows that we're racing or not. Uh, I've also got a triathlon, but unfortunately and frustratingly, triathlons don't show up on the watch right now. So it's on my calendar in June, but it doesn't show up at all right here. But what's fascinating is the outward calendar first, then we'll talk the race widget for the near term stuff. So looking at this, this is the Paris one I have. Uh, and you can see this is the time I've set it for and the date. Uh, and if I go down, it'll show me my predicted finish time. This is based on my current VO2 max trends. Uh, and the only problem is every time I switch a Garmin watch, it drops my VO2 max by like four to seven units. And it's done that here as well. And thus this isn't quite correct yet. Generally, I find it takes like one to two more weeks or about five to six weeks in total before it finally like snaps back to reality. But this will update over time and that's fine. Uh, this is the average temperature on race day for that particular location. 
Uh, and this is the particular course that I've loaded into there. And then finally, this is the route of the course itself. However, once my race day gets within range, within like weather prediction range, it'll show me my actual forecast for that day and that exact hour at that location. Uh, it's pretty cool stuff. A couple caveats though. Number one is that the predictive time only works for running right now. You can load cycling events in there and you can see those, but it won't show a predictive time for that today anyways. Uh, down the road, that sounds like that's probably in the hopper. However, that gets to probably an even more important change, which is that when you create a race on the calendar, it automatically revamps your entire training plan to target that rate. It'll actually build an entire training plan behind the scenes in terms of builds and tapers, recoveries uh, for each successive week to get there. Now, just sticking an event on the Garmin Connect calendar doesn't necessarily build out all those workouts on the Garmin calendar itself, but it does do it behind the scenes on the watch. And if you go into the daily suggested workouts on the watch, you can see what event it's targeting, and you can also see what workouts are coming up. Previously, you couldn't see the workouts beyond just today. Now you can see future workouts. You can also change things like what you want to be your long run or long ride day of the week. And this has even more implications beyond that because it's also tied into training status. So it's looking at what you're trying to do from an event standpoint and saying, does this particular thing meet that goal? And does it match what you need for training status? Next up is the addition of real-time stamina. This was added in the Phoenix 7 and Epic series. And the goal behind this is to show you whether or not you can reach the finish line based on your current effort. Uh, so this is not really ideal for longer term workouts or longer term races, uh, but it also works for short stuff down to like 40-ish or so minutes is kind of the sweet spot there. Uh, before below that, it gets a bit tough to, to nail. But during the workout, you can see your current energy level at that given intensity. So that given pace or power, uh, and it'll project out how far you can go at that current level. So as you increase intensity, it'll go ahead and decrease both the distance till empty as well as your time till empty. And you can use those to try to judge based on you know your goal for a finished duration or finished distance whether or not you'll make the finish line. Next up another quick one that was added to the 45955 from the Phoenix 7 etc series is phone based configuration. You can now configure all the settings, all your data fields, all your data pages on the phone itself as well as virtually almost everything on the watch. But the only things you can't do is sensor pairing from the phone as well as map downloads from the phone. Uh, it tells you to go onto the watch for that. Next up a quick one is that the 955 now supports what's called up ahead. Uh, so if you load a course in and on that course on Garmin Connect, you add waypoints. So things like a cafe stop or the summit or whatever it may be, those will show up on a new data page on the watch itself. So you can now see the distance to each one of those waypoints with a little icon and whatever wording you define. Uh, I find this super helpful on really long hikes or really long adventures. So we're getting down to the finish here. Uh, the next one is spectator messaging. So this was added in to the 945 LTE a year ago, but virtually no other watch. So if you set up a live track session and enable the spectator messaging option, just like you normally would do, they'll receive a link to your live track session where they can see where you are on the map, they can see the course loaded up ahead of time, they can see your heart rate, all that fun stuff. Except now they can send you little messages like cheering and encouragement uh, back to your watch. Of course, some events don't allow this, notably a lot of triathlons don't, but most running races do allow you to carry a phone with you, so it's not a problem there. And then last bit of newness before we talk about some of the accuracy is that the optical heart rate sensor on the 955 is Garmin's Elevate V4. It's the same optical heart rate sensor we've seen for the past year or so. Uh, it's in here as well. And since I know some will ask, there's no word on whether or not this particular optical heart rate sensor supports ECG. That's something that leaked out that Garmin has been working on on their Venue 2 Plus. You can see my video up in the corner or something like that as well on that. Uh, I don't know whether or not it's not on the 955 and they're certainly not saying. Okay, so before we get into accuracy, a lot of you are asking, will these new features features come to the Phoenix 7 and the 945 LTE? And the answer is yes. Garmin says virtually all of these software focused features are coming to those two watches. I've got an exact list uh, here on the screen right now uh, and expect those to come very, very shortly. So with that, let's jump over to the computer and talk accuracy. Starting off on this relatively steady state workout, the 955 and the 255 were spot on across the board here, zero problems at all. However, switching to this interval workout, they actually had a rough go in the first couple minutes in the warm up, which is sort of odd. Yet the complex part, these 20 by 20 second sprint repeats, they nailed across the board every single one perfectly. So I'm not sure what happened there in the very beginning. Another interval workout here, four by 400s, uh, very high intensity, and then four by 800s, high intensity, zero problems. Transitioning into an indoor trainer workout with a slew of intervals, spot on across the board. Actually even beating out the ticker chest strap at the very beginning there. Uh, the same is true for yet another, this one was a Peloton workout. And then here is an outside ride in the very middle of the red section is I was doing some filming, so just ignore that. 
But if we look across the rest of the ride, it's relatively fine. There's some kind of wobbles towards the end as I get back in the city with cobblestones and stuff like that. Uh, but overall, it is mostly acceptable for an outdoor bike ride. Next, we're going to start off right in the swim for the GPS accuracy. And you can see here the 255 and the 955 are virtually identical. I actually think the 255 went into base GPS mode here. A couple little quirks, uh, but I don't think it was actually in multiband correctly. Either way, super impressive. Going into the forested areas here, it just gets super boring because it's perfect. The 255 and the 955 are spot on across the board. Another round here out into kind of some farmlands with some bridges and whatnot, spot on. But here is when things get fun. This is a run that had all sorts of goodness in it, including the city section I showed you earlier. What I want you to look at here is all the variation in the GPS tracks from the Polar Pacer Pro, the Coros Vertex 2, even Garmin's own 945 LTE is sort of everywhere. But as I peel that away and show you just the 255 and 955 tracks, they are very, very clean. In this case, I think the 255 again had multiband turned off for some reason due to firmware update. Uh, but overall, it's very, very close to where I actually ran. This despite having giant buildings on the side of me. Uh, again, super, super impressive GPS accuracy across the board here from both units. Okay, so where do we stand overall on the watch? I'd say I'm pretty impressed, especially with the price point. I was expecting this to be more expensive, to be honest, uh, but for them to come in at $4.99 for the base unit and $5.99 for the solar unit, that is super competitive. I mean, that's like half the price of some of the Phoenix 7 Sapphire editions that have multi-band. Uh, and this has multi-band in it. It has a larger storage and it has touch and it has maps and it has, I mean, it's basically a Phoenix 7, except it's plastic. If I look at the new features like the HRV status and the training readiness, uh, they're clearly like well thought out, especially the training readiness. I really like that. It emulates a lot of what we saw Fitbit doing of having multiple components that drive kind of the daily readiness sort of score there and not being so likely to be heavily swayed by just a single bad night's sleep, which is something like Whoop and others have some challenges with. Still, it's not perfect. The fact that I'm still seeing unproductive on this uh, based on what I'm pretty Pretty sure is like a VO2 Max new watch bug sort of thing uh, isn't ideal. I totally get that's going to go away in a few more weeks once I you know get just the right categories of workouts uh, that it recognizes my correct VO2 Max score. Uh, and at that point, things will probably be pretty good. Anyways, hopefully you found this interesting useful. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, you definitely should. I've got a huge beginner's guide, complete user interface tour of this dropping tomorrow. I'm um, you know, 45 or so minutes long. I've also got a video on the 245 as well. It's been sitting over here this entire time. Uh, up in the corner there, another guide for that dropping in the next few days, and plenty more things to check out somewhere on the screen. And of course, if you found this useful or interesting, just simply whack that like button. It really helps out the video quite a bit. With that, have a good one.